Charles Dickens once wrote, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of reason, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. This description of our, a period of time in his day reminds us of some of the conditions of our day. We live in a great age of miracles and wonders. We have a higher standard of living and more education than any generation of the past. We enjoy the greatest comforts and the finest luxuries. We have more goods and better services than any other people have ever had. Our nation is the most prosperous and powerful ever known. Indeed, this is the best of times. But this is also the worst of times. We are also confronted by bigger problems, by greater dangers than man has ever faced before. Delinquencies, crime, destructive wars, immorality, and other sins are scoring new highs. Serious disturbances are taking place in nature. We probably constitute the worst wicked age. The most important responsibility that the Lord has ever laid is that of making the best and most of our lives. If we make the worst of times the best of times, we will be going directly towards heaven. But if we make the best of times the worst of times, we will be going backwards. We're all quite aware of the Lord's miracles, teachings, and doctrines. We know of his example. Yet sometimes we are so far away. We live in the very best of times, yet we may be so far away from his teachings and doctrines. The scriptures clearly compares our day with the days of Noah, when the people of his time brought destruction upon themselves. It must be clear to each of us that the problems then and now is our poor relationship with the Lord. From the very beginning, the Lord has tried to get man to follow his divine counsel, aimed at peace, prosperity, and happiness for all of us. Unfortunately, man's responses to his efforts have almost always been negative, and we continue to follow our own devices and wisdom in leading each other astray. Jeremiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Both our past and our present proves that of ourselves we lack the ability to solve our own problems. More than anything else, and more than ever before, we need direction from the Lord. Jesus Christ diagnosed our problems when he said, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Again he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. His divine instructions gave us all the answers to any problem that might confront us. But his doctrines and teachings did not go very well with the people in his time, nor in our time. They fell on deaf ears. The people in his time and we, who live in this, the last dispensation of the fullness of times, chose to follow the, the false doctrines of man. This program for substituting the doctrines of man for those taught by the Lord has been very harmful and very extensive. Today in America, it is against the law to talk about God in the schools of some states. In these schools, one must not read the Bible, one must not sing Christmas carols, and prayer is prohibited because someone's sensibility might be offended. Atheism may be taught in the schools, but not the Word of God. The sin and evil that the Lord came to free us from are in many places today running unchecked throughout our nation and the rest of the world. Crime is at an all-time high, 
Sin as it is at an all-time high, and immorality among the youth and the adults is at an all-time high. Jesus came as our example. He lived a sinless life and furnished us with a working model of righteousness. His simple message was, follow me. He asked us to follow him in his teachings, to follow him in his righteousness, and to follow him in his love for others. Unfortunately and sadly, many have not followed him. Rather, they have followed those who could find no room for his teachings, his miracles, or his doctrines. Many have made no room for him because their lives are loaded down with sin and pleasures. Others have made room for their physical comforts. They have made room to expand their educational opportunities, but they have crowded him out. Some have made room to work more hours to accumulate material possessions. Still others have made room to multiply their luxury and increase their leisure time, and have made room for more sports and entertainment, but they have made no room for him. They have made room for many violations of the Sabbath day, but they have made no room for the Savior of the world, our Redeemer and Savior. Today, the Lord is pleading with us through the spoken word, through the scriptures, through the spirit, through his prophets, through the witness of faithful parents, friends, and teachers. But we still have no room for him. We have no room for his teachings and doctrines because most of us are looking for a religion of convenience, one that takes no time, costs no money, and requires no effort, and one that will fit our lives without any changes. It is no wonder the Lord said, the foxes have holes and the birds have, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. As we watch our government hopelessly grapple with the mighty problems of the day, perhaps we should take a look at the way the Lord would handle the problems of our day. The world in general works on the effects and results of the problems, while the Lord zeroed in on the roots and the causes. The Lord advocated preventive measures while man attacks the problems after they have arisen. Man's answer to crime is better law enforcement, bigger and better locks on doors, bigger and better prisons, bitter, bigger and better rehabilitation, and more bigger and better arms and weapons. But the Lord's answer is to love your neighbor as yourself and do good to others as you would have them do to you. Man's answer to poverty is public welfare through food stamps, loans, guaranteed income, publicly financed housing, and other things. The Lord's answer is to teach self-reliance, to help people help themselves. Man's answer to the problems of immorality are birth control pills, homes for unwed mothers, venereal disease clinics, sex education, and divorce counselors. The Lord's answer is to teach the virtues of chastity, love, and purity. The Lord's approach to problems and his approach to resolving them probably would not make headlines, nor the six o'clock news, but nevertheless, his approach would solve our nation's problems as well as the world's problems, and it would revolutionize our world. Paul tried to teach the Ephesians how to be good Christians and good people. The lesson is also a good lesson for us. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is not only a great counsel for us, but also a great philosophy to follow. It is a great philosophy of life, which all of us need if we are to become bigger to the problems to be solved in our day. Man's attempts to solve his problems by legislation, bribery, force, or education have always been failed. All of his problems could easily be solved by a return to the true religion of Christ. As members of his true church, we should lead the way in fighting for God and country, for law and order, for health and strength, industry and courage, for truth and righteousness, and for each other. We need to take the time to worship, to meditate, and to develop a more personal 
meaningful relationship with the Lord. We need to get acquainted with his teachings. We need to feed our hearts on the things of the Spirit. We need to, more than ever before, be more practical to begin to think today what Jesus thought. We can fill our minds with our Heavenly Father's purpose and our hearts with an understanding of his ways. We can open the door of our soul and make room for the Savior to come in. The door of our hearts can still be opened from within. Our invitation to the Lord to enter our hearts must come from the inside. The inspired counsel from the prophet Job should be ringing in our ears when he said, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. The Lord is still saying to us as he did in his time when he declared, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. My prayer, my brothers and sisters, is that we will make the worst of times the very best of times by making room for the Redeemer of the world in our personal lives. I testify that he is the living bread which came down from heaven. He is the promised Messiah and the Savior of the human race. He is the eternal judge of the souls of men and the conqueror of death and sin. He is our deliverer. He is our all because he gave all of his for us. He is Jesus the Christ. He lives. He is our salvation from sorrow and sin. He is the Christ. I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.